Fantastic. And do people hear me well? Do you hear me yes. well? Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. Okay. So I'm Professor Austin. And uh, I am from University of Michigan, and I'm going to be doing the lecture on uh, resilient system design. And specifically, we're going to talk about why is resilient system design important? And what are the benefits to be had with integrating the support into the design of the computing system? You get better reliability and at a lower cost. So really, the, the, the motivation behind resilient system design in the past it was you know 20 30 years ago it was about you know let's build a computer that can't go down so the typical scenario people would talk about would be the computers that run the phone system i don't want the phone system to go down because when that would happen you know if people needed to make an emergency call they wouldn't be able to do it or the computers you put into a space satellite for example you wouldn't want them to fail because you can't go service them so they would uh, they focus very much on resiliency in those designs, but today resiliency is more about uh, extending the life of silicon. And here's some quotes from a number of you know well-known silicon technologists saying how you know the end of silicon, the end of Moore's law, where that lands is in a lot of ways determined by how reliably we can build the silicon. And the ability to build reliable silicon is really under threat, as we'll see when devices get very small. And we need to build reliable silicon because if it's not reliable, then we're going to end up having systems that uh, don't work well. Either they use too much power or they just don't function the way we intended them to. So the idea that we're putting more and more resiliency mechanisms into computing systems is definitely a trend that's been going on for at least the last decade. So today I want to talk about sort of the fundamentals of reliability. How do we measure reliability? What are the sources of, of, um, of faults in systems that lead to less reliable systems? What are some of the classic techniques for getting rid of these faults? And what are some of the more new and sort of computer design specific techniques that are both lower cost and even higher resiliency than traditional stuff? I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my work, which are systems that can uh, that that can detect their own faults and, and correct those faults, uh, both in terms of uh, functional correctness as well as in terms of uh, power, because we're going to see that power and reliability are two facets of a design that are so intimately linked. So when you look at reliability threats in the semiconductor space, uh, something you'll see very soon is, is this bathtub curve. That's a curve which plots the failure probability of devices on the silicon as a function of time. And time in terms of how long have you been using this particular device. And the bathtub curve represents three really interesting places in the, uh, in the lifetime of silicon. Uh, the first area over here is when transistors are very new, they actually have a fairly high probability of failing. And the, and the reason is, is because during the manufacturing process, it can be the case that some devices aren't very reliable. And those devices will, because of the sort of inherent yield issues in silicon manufacturing, some of those devices will fail very soon. And that, that's these early failures that we see where the graph comes up on this side. Then when the device is deployed out into the world and you know it's you know, it's your phone, it's your computer, it's your laptop. After this initial period, the failure rate is at its lowest. And uh, we call it the grace period. That is the lifetime of the device. And then you see sometime in the future, you see this spike up again, where 
stuff starts to have a much greater chance of failure. And this is really the result of when you use silicon devices, you are compromising there. You're moving towards what we call the breakdown period. That you know, you know, there's only so many times you can switch a transistor before that transistor just doesn't switch anymore. And we'll look at some of those, some of those mechanisms like electro migration and gate oxide breakdown. And at that point, pretty much every device starts to fail. And you get into this region where it just doesn't even make sense to you to try and protect against these failures because they're growing at an exponential rate. You know, and the goal of, you know, technology people, you know, if you go to Intel and talk to people that work in the fabs, the goal is to really make this period, this grace period, as long and as low as possible. That's really their goal of technology development. But one of the big challenges is as we get to smaller and smaller silicon, what happens is this curve moves up and over and it shrinks the grace period and it increases the overall level of threats, reliability threats that the silicon faces. So, you know, modern silicon is just not as reliable as silicon of days uh, past. And so really the goal of resiliency mechanisms is just to extend the lifetime of technology scaling, the lifetime, the, the number of years over which we'll continue to shrink devices. You know, many people thought 10 nanometers would be the end of silicon scaling, but we've already seen seven nanometers from TSMC in Taiwan. Uh, Intel is also talking about seven nanometers. TSMC is now talking about five nanometers. They're even hinting at one nanometer devices. So it's interesting how um, people are continuing to scale technology. But, and, and I'll say the reason why they want to scale that technology is smaller transistors cost less, right? So if you can make a transistor smaller, then your existing design on the new technology requires less silicon, it's cheaper, and now you can sell your device either for a higher profit or you can sell your device at a lower cost. So scaling is a very important mechanism in silicon to make computers uh, more capable as well as lower cost over time. But as we saw on the previous slide, as you scale to lower, smaller and smaller technologies, the reliability of the devices is less. So that means you're gonna to have to put things into your design to make them more reliable. And so that's gonna increase the cost of the design. And then you're gonna end up with this curve where there's this break-even point right here, where at that point, it doesn't make sense to scale silicon anymore because your transistors will get smaller, your overall chip, uh, size of your design will get smaller, but the stuff that you add to it to make it reliable will mean that it's no, it just costs more than the previous design. So in essence, what reliability can do is it can push that out further. Low cost reliability mechanisms make that crossover point further out, which means that you can continue scaling more, which means that the end of Moore's law is a little bit pushed off more than it would normally be. And it's, it's really, it's good for the entire industry. So reliability is a very important aspect to concentrate on in the design of, of electronics. All right, so let's take a look at what are the kind of things that threaten reliability in electronics today, and then let's try to see some mechanisms. Let's see how we quantify, first of all, those, those uh, faults as we call them. And then let's see how we can protect systems against those faults. So uh, in traditional reliable system design, we classify faults into three classes. Uh, permanent faults, or hard fault as they're called, is a fault that occurs when something breaks and it can't unbreak itself. Like this is the, uh, the example we, I used earlier of a transistor burning out or a wire shorting out. Once a permanent fault occurs, that damage is irreversible, and you'll always you always see that damage when you try to use that device. On the other end, we've got these things called transient faults, and these are faults that occur sometimes because they're not physical damage; they're electrical interference. And the most common form of these are what we call soft errors, 
A soft error is soft error is where a transistor in electronics all of a sudden turns on or turns off, and it's not because it's damaged; it's because it's being uh, it's being subjected to some natural radiation source, typically neutrons and alpha particles. We'll see that uh, in a little bit. It's a really interesting effect, one that um, pretty much all high-end designs today are very concerned about. And then we have, in the middle, we have this thing called the intermittent fault. And we don't spend too much time on intermittent faults. But intermittent faults are what make uh, debugging silicon really, really tough. So this is, an, this is a fault that doesn't occur all the time. It only occurs under certain conditions. Uh, I think the, the classic one is where, like, you've got two bus lines running on a chip. And when one line goes up and down and the other stays idle, the chip works fine. When the other line goes up and, and down and the other stays idle, the chip works fine. But when the two lines operate in opposite direction to each other, you get something called the Miller effect. And that significantly decreases propagation latency on the wire due to this shared capacitance effect. And then all of a sudden you get an error in this very specific case. These are really hard to debug. And the reason why bringing up chips is really a, a talent, special talent. We're not gonna to spend too much time on them. We're mostly gonna focus on the permanent and transient faults, but intermittent faults are certainly interesting kind of fault to look at as well. So let's take a look at these soft errors. They're also called transient faults. They're also called transients and even single event upsets, SEUs. And they're the result of some high energy particle that's in our environment. Alpha particles come from the breakdown of, um, you know, you know, charged materials. They emit alpha particles. Uh, neutrons tend to come from outer space, and you know, they tend to be filtered out by the atmosphere. But some of them come, get to the surface. When they hit our electronics, they deposit charge into the electronics. And if you study how transistors work. They work based on accumulated charge. So if there's, a, if there's a natural radiation source which can insert charge into your transistors, all of a sudden you have the ability to flip a bit in a, in a register or to glitch the output of a gate. And that can cause problems in the computation of a normal circuit. So these soft errors, again, they're created by typically some natural radiation source that strikes a silicon atom, which releases charge. That charge can float into the, into the channel of a transistor and can temporarily turn it on. And if that temporary unexpected turn on causes an error in the computation, then you've got yourself a transient fault. Now, fortunately, a transient fault, it's like, it's like two train tracks crossing with no gates. You know, most of the time, train comes whipping through, there's no other train on the track, nothing bad's gonna happen. It's just that occasional moment when two trains meet each other at the crossing tracks that they run into each other and there's a huge explosion. And that's the same thing with soft errors. If a soft error occurs on a circuit and that circuit is not being used, then there's no harm, no foul, nothing bad happens. And so there's lots of ways that soft errors cannot result in a fault manifesting in your design. So let's go through the list of ways in which soft errors don't lead to faults. So your, your silicon has been struck by a natural radiation source, it's released charge, that charge is moved into the channel of a gate, that gate is turned on temporarily, and nobody cares. So let's look at why nobody might care. The first is what's called logic masking. Logic masking, we got this little gate here that got hit and it sends a one glitch out to this second gate. That's an AND gate. The other input to the AND gate is a zero and zero AND anything is zero. So this glitch gets stopped right here because of the logic mask. So they're the state of the circuit. Uh, said so we're unable to see that particular glitch. Another way to mask out and not experience a fault is timing masking. 
And this is the case where there's a glitch in the circuit. The glitch propagates through the circuit due to a soft error, but it doesn't get latched into the output of the current stage of logic. So that means that it never gets captured by a flip-flop or a latch. And so it's, it, excuse me. So it's not possible for uh, any state in the system to be exposed to the fault. And that's simply because the glitch is a small, you know, it's a small upset in the, in the, in the output of the logic. It's not held continuously. And so that glitch has to arrive within the setup time of a particular latch. Otherwise, the latch just ignores it, doesn't capture it. The next source of loss that you get where you don't see a fault manifest from a transient error is electrical masking, which happens to be due to the fact that gates are amplifiers, but they're amplifiers with, a, uh, with an amplitude of less than one. So when you don't hold the input of a gate and allow that value to propagate across the entire chain of gates, when you give it a glitch and that glitch propagates, because the gain of a gate, a natural silicon gate is less than one, you'll see that the amplitude on each successive layer of logic of the transient will decrease and potentially decrease to the point where it's no longer interpreted as a one, it's interpreted as a zero, and then the event is over. If it doesn't get to the latch with enough strength to actually change the state of the logic, then you have what's called electrical mask. And then finally, you've probably been studying microarchitecture in this class, and you know about branch prediction and maybe load store speculation and all the different ways that we do computation in a microarchitecture, but then potentially throw away that computation simply because we predicted a branch wrong or we used a load value too early, et cetera. And when that computation gets thrown away, even if that computation had a transient fault in it, that transient fault gets thrown away. So this is another form of masking in the microarchitecture. And then finally, there's even masking in the software level. And this is a very interesting effect where what you can do is you can take software and just randomly flip bits in the software. And sometimes it doesn't even matter to the software. A great example of this is you've got some uh, Boolean variable. And the Boolean variable is either zero or non-zero. And a bit gets flipped in the Boolean variable. And it's not the least significant bit. So now the Boolean, which was one, is now five. I mean, that's still non-zero. That's still a Boolean true. So it doesn't affect the computation of the program. So there's, there's also the case where even if the microarchitecture commits the result of a transient fault, software might not care about it. So it's really interesting. There's lots of ways that transient faults can hurt us. So do we have to worry about transient faults? Well, you really have to be able to measure the rate at which a particular transient fault would occur. And the typical way we measure transient fault rates is in what are called fits, failures in time, which is uh, a measurement that came out of IBM in the 70s. And what it means, a, a fit of one um, means one failure in 10 to the nine hours, all right? So uh, a fit of 114 means one failure that is visible in the system that causes software running on the system to fail every thousand years. That sounds like a pretty good failure rate, right? I mean, what's the chance we've ever experienced that? You know, we're probably only going to use the system ourselves a couple of years. Uh, but it turns out that if you're a company like IBM or Intel and you're creating millions and millions of chips, then, you know, a failure rate of one in every thousand years is probably a non, it's probably an interesting non trivial amount of failures because when you multiply that times, you know, a million units in the field, all of a sudden, you know, it, it, once per thousand years, if you have a hundred thousand units in the ship to the market, you know, you're probably going to see one end user per week experience a failure because 
a failure of one every thousand years doesn't mean it's always at a thousand years. It means it's one in any one of those years. So now you have a hundred thousand users. Now you have a hundred thousand users that could have a fault in any one. Well, now you're starting to see a non-trivial number of faults. So what's interesting is you'll see like a lot of times uh, silicon manufacturers will be designing to have less faults than any individual system would care about. You know, for me, my own purpose, I think one failure in a thousand years is just fine. One failure in a hundred years is probably just fine for me. But to a company that has to service millions of computers, they may want significantly lower fault rate. There's some other interesting considerations when you look at soft errors. In particular, the higher the altitude you have, uh, the more soft errors you're going to have. And I'll just say, like, I'm I'm in Michigan, so I'm at about a hundred, maybe fifty meters elevation. You folks are in Addis Ababa. You're at what twelve hundred meters elevation. The soft error rate of your electronics is going to be way higher than my electronics, simply because. I have a thousand eleven hundred meters of air above me that you don't have. So, uh, because of that, the probability that a charged particle gets to my electronics is lower than the probability of yours. The example they always use in the U.S. is is uh, Denver, because Denver's at, at about the same altitude as uh, I think it's a little bit lower than Addis Ababa. Uh, it's it's about one mile high. And so, uh, you know, companies started to notice that my electronics in Denver have much, you know, higher fault rates from transient errors than, than that in, in other places. And this even goes even further when you get into space electronics. And when you look at the design of electronics for spacecraft, um, soft errors are a significantly higher consideration. Why? Because, well, where do those, where do those charged particles come from, first of all? They come from the sun. Right, they're flying through space, and then they get attracted to the Earth because of its uh, magnetic uh, poles, and so they get they get attracted to Earth. So they're just flying through space, heading to the nether nether regions of outer space, and then they come by Earth, and Earth is this charged, you know, charged entity, and then they get sucked into Earth. And when they get sucked into Earth, then they get stopped by the atmosphere. But if you're a satellite, you know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, you know, if you're a satellite, you guys watch satellite TV there, that satellite that broadcasts that TV to Otis, it's in space, right? It has no protection from the atmosphere. So its electronics are getting hit all the time with soft errors. So they need really reliable mechanisms in those electronics to stop those soft error events. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at some, uh, just a study that was done at University of Illinois to write, try to figure out, you know, if there's all these ways that these soft errors can be stopped, well, what's the probability that we're going to get a soft error in our, in our electronics? And it's pretty low. It's about a 95% reduction in the base error rate. So whatever the error rate that you're flipping uh, that you're experiencing charged particles hitting your devices and causing glitches in circuits. Take those events, only 5% of those events will result in any kind of impact to software running on the system. Um, but they also found another interesting effect that sometimes, uh, about 15% of the time, sometimes when you have a single particle hit electronics, it actually causes multiple glitches in multiple transistors. So it's not just simple 5%, because sometimes when you have these upsets, you actually do get multiple faults from one charged particle hitting it. But it, roughly about 95% of anything that hits your chip is not gonna cause any problems, just naturally. So that's soft errors. Uh, we worry about software, especially in space applications, especially in memory where, you know, over time they can, they, they're held in memory, but in, in electronics, we don't worry about them too much, except in you know, highly reliable systems. 
The other kind of fault besides transient faults are the permanent faults. And those are becoming more and more of a concern for silicon, especially when silicon you know, gets very, very small. So again, let's look at this chart. This is called the bathtub curve. And this curve really determines the rate at which you see these permanent failures in transistors. And there's a really wide range of failure modes. There's uh, probably the most common one are what are called hot electrons, where what happens is you turn a gate on, you turn a gate off, you turn a gate on, you turn a gate off. Sometimes when you turn it off, one of the electrons that was attracted into the channel to turn the transistor on gets stuck in the dielectric of the transistor. And that's called a hot electron. And what that does is it puts charge into the gate. And it means to turn this transistor on in the future, I don't need as much charge because there's charge embedded in that gate. And if enough charge gets embedded in the gate, the gate will just break. It'll stay on all the time. Electromental migration is also another pretty popular uh, failure mechanism. And this has to do with the fact that when you, when you push a lot of current through a wire, the wire metal starts to flow in the direction of the current. And as it flows, the wire gets thinner. As the wire gets thinner, the rate of flow goes up. As the rate of flow goes up, the wire gets thinner and you get this positive feedback, which can lead to wires actually breaking over time. NBTI is a form of charge that can get embedded in the gate uh, channels. And then all of these really constitute forms of gate wear out, where as you use gates more and more, they tend to wear out. But wear out really isn't the focus of this very first part of the curve where we see a lot of uh, failures early on. These are the result of manufacturing, producing particularly weak devices that are not well suited to reliable design. And, and you see that the, these devices would typically fail in a permanent fashion within a few months. Now, one way you could prevent these from getting out into the field and not having to replace those electronics is you could, you could, you could run those devices for a few months in the lab. That would be very expensive and very time consuming. So what they do in manufacturing electronics is they do what's called burn-in. And with burn-in, you're gonna run devices at an elevated temperature and an elevated voltage and an elevated frequency. These are the three things that cause, they aggravate the failure mechanisms on a chip. So they're basically punishing these chips, typically for 24 to 48 hours to try and get them to fail faster than a few months from now. By going with high voltage, high temperature and high frequency, we are gonna see these chips fail very quickly. And so once you get out of burnout without a failure, then chances are the rest of the devices are very robust. And you'll see yourself go into this grace period with a very low error rate over time. There's always the possibility of some errors, but the probability is quite a bit less. And then over time, you get the buildup of hot electrons. You get the flowing of metal and electromyelitis migration. And over time, at some point in the future, boom, everything just starts to break. And all the transistors are roughly failing at the same rate. It's somewhat proportional to their use in the underlying uh, microarchitecture. But roughly, there's lots of transistors that are kind of failing at the same rate. So that's when you get into this avalanche breakdown period. And it's not really... There's really no use in trying to stop this. You know, what you really want to do is design silicon that pushes this out as far as possible. But we're not going to build resiliency mechanisms to stop this exponential increase in transistor failures. We're going to build resiliency mechanisms to tolerate these initial failures. And we're also going to build resiliency mechanisms to try and tolerate the occasional failure during the grace period. Another sort of related issue to manufacturing is the notion of variability. 
the variability really has to do with the fact that manufacturing silicon is less like you know woodworking and more like baking you know it is a very imprecise process and which is strange to say because we're dealing with dimensions that are so small they can't be seen by even the very best tells you know uh microscopes you know but it is the it is the case that we when we build silicon electronics we are essentially baking and and building these these chips using processes that we don't have particularly strong control over and as a result what you'll see is that individual devices their characteristics will vary sometimes on a factor of two in terms of how fast they are, how much performance they provide, how much power they consume. And typically these devices, you know, if we measure some characteristic like power or speed, they, their, their overall uh, characteristics will form this bell curve where most of the devices will kind of be like this device but some devices will be like this device. Some devices will be like this. Very few devices will be like this device. Very few devices will be like this device. And so one of the goals of reliability is to sort of tolerate this range of variability and performance and power that devices, uh, that devices can experience. A really good form of variability to look at is doping variability. So doping is the process of when you create a channel for the transistor, you know, we've got the gate, we've got the source, we've got, excuse me, we've got this drain and the source, we've got the gate over the channel. The channel has to be doped, to be depleted of electrons, if it's you know, a P channel. And then when the gate applies a voltage, it's gonna attract electrons into the channel and that's gonna form a current. So, and to create this doping, typically what they'll do is they'll inject boron atoms into the channel. And that, you know, they, they, the way they do that is they, they expose only the channels of the chip, they cover the rest of the chip, and then they put the uh, chip into an oven. In the oven, they've got boron gas in there, and then some of the gas will diffuse into these exposed channels. And, you know, 10 years ago, the number of boron atoms that would go into a channel would be, you know, on the order of millions. And so if you had 10 less or 10 more, it was no big deal. And you would have 10 less and 10 more uh, because there's, you know, you're basically exposing the channel to a gas and, and hoping that a certain amount of boron will flow into that channel and bind with that material. Today, there's dozens of atoms of boron in the channels of these very small transistors. And so when you have 12 atoms of boron creating your channel, and this transistor over here has 11, and this one over here has 13, that's a 10% that's a difference roughly. That's a fairly sizable difference. And so those devices will have very different characteristics. So as devices get smaller, as the amount of material that form those devices gets smaller and less quantities, the, the small variations that they experience in the manufacturing process become very large differences in terms of their performance, power, characteristics. Another aspect of chip that's very interesting is when we create the layers of a chip, they use grinding mechanisms to basically uh, whittle away the material until it's the thickness they want. So a classic example here is the gates. You've got the source, the drain, and the transistor. You have the gate over the channel. The thickness of the gate is a strong determinant of the performance and power requirement of the, of the transistor. And so the, when they manufacture these, these transistors, they want a very tight control over how thick that gate is. Well, how do they determine the thickness of the gate? They deposit the gate down, and then they grind it using a special grinder until it's just the thickness they want. Well. Grinder isn't completely flat. The thing that's grinding isn't completely level. And so you, what you'll see is in some parts of the die, this is looking down at a die of a chip, which is about usually, you know, 20 centimeters wide. You know, in some places it's a little bit thinner. In some places it's a little bit thicker. 
And this leads to devices over here being faster and higher power and devices over here being slower and lower power. Now, now we got a real, it's, it's a reliability mechanism in the sec, in, in the fact that I can't really rely on, you know, I wanted a, you know, I wanted a two nanosecond device here and I got a 2.1 here and I got a 2.2 here. I got a 1.8 over here. Um, that's, a, that can be a problem if your design strategy doesn't tolerate these kinds of unexpected uh, aspects of the design. And then I just want to point out, you know, DRAM, which we all know, right? We've got DRAM, I've got DRAM in this system right now. DRAM is inherently unreliable. I mean, it's built to be unreliable because uh, the way DRAM works is it doesn't store state, it stores charge and that charge can be dissipated. That charge is stored in a, a simple little capacitor. It's a channel capacitor, this thing right here, or a trench capacitor as they're sometimes called. And to put a one in a transistor, we're gonna put a charge in that device and to put a zero, we're gonna bleed that charge off. Now that charge is constantly dissipating. It is leaking out of here. It's like a little bucket with holes in the bottom. And that charge is always leaking out. And so the way we make DRAM more reliable is we have to refresh it. We got to continuously reread it. So we have this refresh controller, which goes in and reads the DRAM out, figures out what values it was, and then recharges those devices. And it continually does this. And so, I mean, here in lies a completely unreliable mechanism. And on top of that, we've tried to build this very reliable memory system. Why would we do such a crazy thing? Because a DRAM cell is one-tenth the size of an SRAM cell, where an SRAM is like a register. It just holds the state forever. You don't ever have to mess with it. And so we get this huge increase in the amount of storage we can store as long as we can tolerate the unreliability and the leakiness of those cells. And so that, that's a really interesting way to take a reliability mechanism and really build it in your favor. And just to sort of build on that idea, NAND flash, you know, the this is a laptop I'm working on right here is an SSD drive in it. And that also is built on, it uses the, the unreliability, the hot electrons that get trapped into the dielectric as a way to, um, as a way to store information in a non-volatile way. It's really quite clever. So, to uh, program an AND flash, here we got the simple gate, source, drain, channel, depleted. We've got the gate and then the dielectric between the gate. The way you program this is you just, you just punish the chip. You put a huge voltage over this gate and you get all these hot electrons trapped in the dielectric. And you trap enough of them so that this gate just gets stuck on. That's the normal failure mode for a gate. That's a gate that's died. But what, he, what they've done here is they put this gate into this, into this broken condition because now when you read this gate, it'll always read as on. And that is storage. That's non-volatile storage. You know, 10 years later, it'll still read as on because those gate, those, those electrons are trapped in the dielectric. So I'm using that hot electron failure mechanism to store information. Now I need the ability to erase that information as well. So what do I do there? I put a strong negative voltage on that dielectric and that forces out those hot electrons. They get repelled out of there. They get pushed out of there. And, and then once again, it looks like it's, it's off, it's off, you know? And so now I've used this failure mechanism to, um, to basically build a non-volatile storage mechanism. So clever, so clever to take, you know, this is a classic example of taking your lemons and making lemonade out of them. Now, one of the challenges with NAND flash is over time, you can get these deeply embedded hot electrons. They cannot come out anymore. They get stuck inside the dielectric. It's, 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 a, it's a bonding process, which basically results in a breakdown of the chemical structure of the dielectric. And that once those get in there, there's no getting them out of there. And so that's where you find you have wear out and your NAND flash. You can only do this right, reverse, right, reverse, right, reverse 
on the order of about 100 to 200,000 times, and then you've destroyed the gate. You've literally destroyed the gate. It'll always be on for all of time. So it's quite interesting to see how, you know, in order to utilize this technology, we have to do things like wear leveling. And, you know, we can't write the same uh, storage over and over again. So when you have an SSD drive, for example, whenever you're writing a piece of storage in an SSD drive, you're not writing the same block that you just read. You know, the, the wear leveler is going to move that data to some other place to really distribute those writes. Okay, now moving on, let's take a look at some fault tolerant design techniques. We've seen transient faults, we've seen permanent faults. How do we stop these faults? Well, there's a there's a number of approaches. If you look at classic resilient system design, you know, they'll say things like, ah, we can use fault avoidance. And this is sometimes very useful. Earlier, we talked about transient faults in electronics and space. And I'll tell you that fault avoidance is typically the approach they use for space electronics. One of the aspects of these transient particles when they hit electronics is the amount of charge they release is pretty much fixed. So if you have a really tiny transistor, as we saw, you can turn on one or two or three or four transistors. But if you have a very large transistor, you know, if a little bit of charge floats in, it doesn't change it from on to off. So often what they'll do in space electronics is just build huge transistors. So, you know, you'll see like a x86 in one micron, you know, it's like a 1980s technology in space. It's not as fast, but I mean, you can pummel this thing with lots of radiation and it doesn't mess with the transistors at all. So it's a nice way to avoid the whole problem. But there's a big cost in terms of silicon cost, in terms of performance of the design. Uh, the alternative approach, which we're going to talk about in here, is really fault tolerance. Fault occurred. Can we detect it? Yes, we detect it. Can we recover from it? Yes, we recovered. Fault is not a problem. So we're going to look at different approaches for both detecting the faults and then recovering from faults. And this is really the classic approaches for uh, detecting and recovering from faults. Uh, and, and this is uh, what's called dual modular redundancy or two version or triple modular redundancy. Uh, if we run two processors side by side running the same programs and then check to see if they produce the same results, we have built a dual modular redundant system which can check to see if there's a fault. Now, how do we know if there's a fault? Now, one of the aspects of transient faults is they're rare, right? They don't occur every minute. Well, in space, they do occur every minute. But in, on Earth, they don't occur every minute. They occur once every eight hours. And of those, 95% you don't ever experience as faults. So you can make an assumption about your design that if there is a fault in the design, it only affects one of the processors. So either this processor got hit or this processor got hit. But the probability that two processors would be hit at the same time is this, it's it's you know it's the probability uh, it's the product of two small probabilities so it's essentially zero. And so what you can do is with two processors here checking each other's output you could determine if there was a fault but if there was a fault, you don't know who had the fault because they just disagree with each other. They don't, they don't tell you which one is wrong. You know, they just disagree. You know, one of them got hit and made the other one disagree, but you don't know which one. And that's where triple modular redundancy comes in handy because again, if we assume that only one of them is affected, then we'll have a voting scheme and two of them will agree and one of them will disagree. The one that disagree is the one that got the fault. And so by having three times as much logic we can, and a voting logic, we can now not only detect the fault, but we can correct it by using the two results that still agree because of the sort of sparseness of transient faults, we're not gonna see those in, we're not gonna see those in other things. Now for permanent faults, the first system again will detect a permanent fault. We assume that they're rare, so they're not gonna happen in both at the same time. 
the second system will detect and correct from a single permanent fault any additional permanent faults that are not in the same module um, are not going to be detected. They're, in fact, you're gonna, now you're going to get three different answers uh, when you get your second fault. So you could tolerate one fault with triple modular redundancy. Excuse me. All right. And uh, the main downside of this is costly, right? Because you this is 100% overhead to detect, 200% overhead to, you know, uh, to detect and correct. I mean, that's very expensive. So, you know, uh, in general, we're gonna wanna look for solutions that are a little bit uh, better than this so that we can have lower costs. Um, here's a really interesting technology. This is a research technology, but it, it's been used in a number of applications, both commercially and in software applications. And it's, it's a really clever way to build a dual modular redundant system. So we have two systems running the same computation and we wanna check to see if they're producing the same results. Now, normally what you do is you just take like the output of every instruction and compare it. The problem with that is, um, you know, there's a lot of instructions, right? There's a lot of different computations going on. So that means there's gonna be a lot of traffic in this comparator here. And, you know, typically it's hard to get that information out. It's sort of deeply embedded in these designs. So what fingerprinting does is it uses a cryptographic hash. What is a cryptographic hash? You might've learned about this if you studied some of the security aspects of this course, but a cryptographic hash is where you take a big body of information and you boil it down to a single hash value, typically 64, 128, 256 bits. And that's what this system does. It runs one of the, on each system, it runs the program. It takes the results of the program, what, what registers are being written, and, and creates from that a hash. That hash, this fingerprint, is then sent on occasion on a predetermined point, like every million instructions, to the checker. The checker checks to see if the two hashes are the same. If the two hashes are the same, then we know with extreme high probability that both did the same computation. In fact, the, the probability that they did different computation is one over two to the n of the number of bits. So if you have a 128 bit hash, you know that's essentially zero probability that they deviated in any way. Now, what's also interesting about this work is there's a recovery model associated with it. Now I said earlier, you can't recover when you only have two systems. Well, that's true for permanent faults, but it's actually not true for transient faults. Now remember, transient faults are very sparse, sparse in space, sparse in time. So you, you see one every couple of days, you know, it's, it's so rare, but they're important to, to defend against. So what the system does is it runs the two processors it checks occasionally their fingerprints. If the fingerprints deviate, it goes back to what's called a checkpoint. A checkpoint is just state that we save so that if we have to go back and rerun the same computation again, we can do that. So it goes, it runs, it takes a checkpoint, it runs, it checks the fingerprints. If the fingerprints differ, then it rolls back to the previous checkpoint and it runs again. The chance that they will differ again with a transient fault is essentially zero because the chance that two transient faults would happen near each other in time is the product of two small probabilities, which is essentially zero. If we do go back and we run again and we do disagree the second time, that is most likely a permanent fault, right? Because permanent fault, you see it every time you run. And at that point, we can say, oh, this system needs to be repaired. So this has the ability to first repair from transient faults and also detect that there's been a permanent fault. Really cool technology. And this is real popular in systems that need to be, um, that need to be high reliability. With triple modular redundancy, we compute three copies of the function and we do the majority vote. Um, and again, more, much more expensive. 
Now, all that previous stuff I was talking about was really checking computation, logic. With state, we have better ways to check whether or not state's been affected by permanent or transient faults. And that is through a technique called error coding. If you've ever heard of ECC DRAM, for example, that's a form of DRAM that has error coding in it. And error coding simply is a technique to detect if bits have been corrupted within memory. So we say typically with ECC, we'll say ECC has, you know, it has the ability to detect two and correct one. What does that mean? That means that if one bit flips in this state, then it will unflip that bit when we read it. It will correct it. If two bits flip in this state, when it reads that state, it'll say this state is corrupted, but I do not know how to correct it because I've seen two bit flips in this particular state. The way we do this is by just defining state in a way where much of the state space is invalid, right? So here I've defined a three-bit state space, but I've only made one, two, three, four of these states valid. And you'll notice there's a kind of a cool property. I have to flip one, two bits to get to any other state. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Now with this particular code, I can detect if a single bit has been flipped, right? If a single bit has been flipped, I might be sitting here, zero, one, zero. But then you have to ask the question, what was the original value? Well, was it this one, 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 zero, or was it this one, zero, zero, zero? And the answer is, I don't know, because you don't know. It could either be the other, it could be either one with equal probability. So the way you get correction is you have to go one, two, three steps to another valid code in every direction on this state space. When you have one, two, three steps to get to a valid code, if you go one step away, you know you're closer to this one than you are to the one over there, so you know where to go back. When you go two steps away, then you're equal distance to the codes. So you know something got corrupted two bits, but you don't know which direction to go. So, and you can design any form of code you want. You can do detect three, correct two, detect four, correct three, you know, whatever. You just, it takes more and more bits to provide that capability. And that's very powerful. These coding techniques are so powerful that we generally don't use anything other than coding to protect state. All the other stuff we're going to talk about is really to protect logic, the computation. Uh, when you want to protect the system, it becomes important to know where is this system compromised? Like what are the aspects of the system that are most likely to fail? And then apply the protections where there's the highest probability of failure. And as we saw before, there's logic masking. There's all kinds of masking that can occur. Logic masking, timing masking, electrical masking, software masking, microarchitecture masking. So there, people have developed tools like the Sarah tool to basically figure out what part of the circuits are most susceptible to experiencing these soft errors. And then what we can do is we can apply the technologies to protect them only in the place where they provide the most value. And what that allows you to do is really reduce the overall cost of protecting a circuit. It's a, it's a real powerful technique to reduce that cost, but still get good reliability. And then also we can, beyond that, we can actually modify the way we design our circuits to um, even further reduce that. So just building circuits with the knowledge that they will be subjected to soft errors. So for example, we can use, you know, strong pull up, strong pull downs, for example, to ensure that, um, that any glitch that occurs early in the circuit is attenuated with higher force, for example. There's also interesting developments in silicon that have made soft errors less of a concern. In particular, one of them are FinFETs. You might've heard of FinFETs before. A FinFET is a different approach for building a transistor, 
where instead of putting the channel in the substrate of the transistor, we build the tra channel into a fin and then wrap the fin on both sides with uh, the gate. What that does is it just increases the surface area between the, the channel and the gate and makes for a faster lower power device. At the same time, it makes the channel a lot smaller, right? This channel actually gets embedded down into this silicon here. This channel is actually fairly large. This channel is just this little fin from here to here. That's smaller. And you can think of these transient faults as they're like darts. You know, it's like throwing darts at a dartboard, right? And the smaller the target is, the harder it's going to be to hit. The probability of a hit is going to be smaller. And so when the industry moved over to FinFETs, they saw this sort of big reduction in soft errors right away due to this device. And I think you'll see that, you know, PinFETs, for example, other futuristic transistor devices will continue to try to reduce the size of that channel and uh, will further reduce the probability of, uh, of, of soft error exposure. So we'll see, there's a good trend in future transistor devices. Here's a soft error protection, which really sort of melds well with a, a very popular microarchitectural technology called simultaneous multi-threading, SMT. So what is simultaneous multi-threading? It's a technique where we take a microarchitecture and provide it multiple contexts, and then we let the hardware do context switching between those other contexts. So you can do things like tolerate the latency of a cache miss. Using simultaneous multi-threading, it's been shown that we can actually run the same program twice on two different threads. And as long as we keep the programs fairly spaced apart on where they're executing in the program, we can compare the outputs of the two threads running on the same piece of hardware and provide soft error tolerance. Because if we get a soft error, the probability that it'll affect two threads in the same way is very, very low. It'll primarily affect one thread or one thread in one way and another thread in another way, causing the results of the two thread computations to deviate. And now we've detected a soft error. Again, like the fingerprinting technique, we can then go back to a checkpoint, re-execute again. If we get the same bad result, then we, we know we've experienced a permanent error. Otherwise, we've tolerated a transient error just using SMT. And SMT, or hyper-threading as Intel calls it, is really pervasive in the industry today. So it's a real nice technique to tolerate stuff. But now I wanna talk a little bit about my research on tolerating design faults. Uh, one of the things I did early in my career was really focus on resilient system design. And one of the things we did was we took on the challenge of tolerating design bugs. Because in a sense, a design bug is like a permanent fault, right? You wanted to have the chip operate one way, but now it operates this other way. Well, it didn't operate that other way because you had a permanent failure in a transistor, it operates this other way because some designer accidentally built the chip wrong. And so we thought, well, wouldn't if we can tolerate permanent faults, why can't we tolerate design faults? And we came up with this, this technology called the Diva Checker. Um, it's an old paper, but it's a good one. And it had a lot of influence over how uh, a, a number, a, a wide range of checking curve. But I want to show you this technology because I think it's pretty cool and it, it, it really sort of pulls together all the different forms of faults into one, one kind. And very simply, what it does is it runs the main core in a way that's as fast and as efficient as possible. That main core, that main core may experience transient faults, permanent faults, and design faults. And then at the commit stage, you know, where you actually retire your results, it's preceded by a checker stage. And what the checker stage does is it just goes to check, it's like, did that main core produce the right results for this computation? And if the checker stage disagrees with the main core, it just flushes the main core and uses its own result that it thinks is the right result. 
because the checker stage is actually more reliable than the main core because this can suffer from transient falls, permanent falls, and design errors as well. And then it restarts the main core on the uh, instruction after the current instruction. Which begs the question, what is in the checker? And what is in the checker is a simple little processor, just a tiny little processor called the checker core. It operates in two modes. First, it operates in what's called check mode. In check mode, it just takes from the main core program counter, instruction, register values it read, and any memory values that it read as well. And it checks and it executes the same thing. It fetches the instruction. It reads its own registers, executes the instruction, and it reads its own cache. It says, did I get the same answer as the main core? And if it did, it retires the result. If it doesn't, it flushes the main core and then switches into recovery mode where it executes one instruction and recovers. So it, it, it can tolerate a design fault because it takes away the ability for the main core to execute that instruction. Sorry, I don't agree with you. I'm going to execute this one myself. Which begs the question, like, how can that simple checker keep up with that big complex core? And it has to do with an effect in microarchitecture called slipstreaming, which is where, you know, this main core, this complex core runs ahead of the checker core and it makes life easier for the checker core and they call it slipstreaming because it comes from auto racing if you've ever seen an auto race you know uh, like formula one or nascar you'll notice that the cars are all in a line right they all follow each other really closely why do they do that they do that because you know you want to be the second car in an auto race that's always the best position because the first car is hitting air that's not moving and so it's expending more energy to to basically uh propel itself and consuming more fuel the car behind the first car is in the slipstream of the first car so it's spending less energy and it's the car at the head of the slipstream so that's why the number two car in an auto race is typically the best position car to win an auto race because uh, when that first car runs out of energy, that, uh, then it's going to have to go get more gas. And then the, the, the slip, the second car is then number one. You do the same thing with microarchitecture, right? What does it mean to get air moving for a microarchitecture? It means to warm up the cache, to predict the branches, to figure out the dependencies through memory, et cetera. And so by sending all that information from the main core to the checker core, the checker core can be much simpler. It doesn't have to be a sports car. It can be this little old Volvo, which was known for highly reliable uh, performance in the, in the automotive world. It can be a pretty simple little car. And it ends up this thing, this, this little checker core, which is very simple and easy to build correct. Um, it doesn't slow you down hardly at all. It only slows you down a couple percent simply because it delays the time it takes to retire instructions. Really cool idea. And it can tolerate permanent faults, transient faults, and design errors too. Another thing I want to talk about today is the challenge of modeling for resiliency. It is fundamentally harder than modeling for performance and power. So typically as a computer architect, when we want to design a system, we build a model for the system that we intend to design. We run the model analyze the model, and that gives us insights into the quality of our design. So, you know, I build my fancy two-level microarchitecture with prefetching, blah, 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 my cool new branch predictor. I run the programs through it that I care about on the simulator, and I get my performance metrics out. You can't do that for reliability. Why? Because reliability is, is really dependent on an unknown, which is the fault. And the unknown aspects of the fault is where does the fault occur? When does the fault occur? How does the fault occur? Those are all characteristics of the fault, which need to be encompassed into the model. So essentially what you need to do is you need to run that one simulation that you would do for performance and power, and you need to put it into what's called a Monte Carlo loop. You need to run it again. 
and again and again and every time injecting faults into different places at different times with different kinds of manifestations and then you you basically measure what is called coverage and coverage is what is the probability that when i inject a fault into this system it recovers that fault and that percentage needs to be you know high enough to satisfy the needs of the system we want it to be high typically we'll uh, assess coverage at, in what we call nines so five nines is 99.99999 right because i mean we want this we want the covers to be very very high right if you had a coverage of 50 percent uh, that's not very impressive you could roughly double the lifetime of the system but if you want really good probabilities of success you need 99.9 nine nine do i need another nine nine you know that's that's the kind of things you deal with for coverage uh and now just in the tail end of this presentation i want to talk a little bit about power and how does power relate to reliability and they are very much two sides of the same coin right in that if you want to have low power, you're going to need to tolerate less reliability. If you want to have high reliability, you're going to pay for it with power. And so, and then we're going to look at a piece of work of mine that tries to cheat by having low power and low right and high reliability at the same time. And I'll show you how. Okay, so um, as we move to smaller devices, we have more devices, we have to have less power for those devices, and the reliability of those devices becomes less. And so we end up, it's in essence, wanting to run with lower voltages, which less reduces reliability. Um, and then ultimately we can't do that and maintain the reliability of the system. So something's gotta get, either the system has to have more power to be reliable, or the system has to run at a slower frequency to give it more time to stabilize its results. So, I mean, what we really want is to be at low power and running as blazingly fast as we were before. We just want to use less energy. It's tough. But power is very important because, you know, we consume a lot of power in, uh, in computation. And, uh, you know, if you're a data center, the primary cost of running your data center is going to be the power that you pay to power your data center. If we can run with lower power, we can reduce the cooling costs of our design. That can be very important. So, I mean, low power is incredibly important aspect of, of designs. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, in, in spaces like the edge and embedded computing, the amount of power something takes determines how long it can run on either scavenged or battery energy, right? If your if your phone runs all two days on a battery instead of one, that's that's a lot better phone. It's a lot, especially if it doesn't give up much capability in running two days on a charge instead of one. And unfortunately, battery power never you know, battery power is one of the least progressive technologies in the world. So we really got to make up for it by building lower power devices without sacrificing reliability or capability. Uh, and so early in my career, I started to get on this idea of what we call better than worst case design, where we would essentially build designs that uh, didn't have the margins necessary to make sure they would never fail. In fact, they, they were built with margins that would allow them to fail at any time but we incorporate into those systems technologies that can recover those failures. So they can run both at low power without high margins on voltage and timing, but still deliver a reliable technology. Let me show you an example of one of these technologies. This is work by Naresh Schambach at Illinois, where he's building filters, uh, you know, uh, like uh, image filters and audio filters, different kinds of signal filters in hardware. And these filters are fairly complex. You know, he's got this main block filter here. 
And then what he does is he builds an estimator. So that's a filter that uses less precision, that uses a simpler technology. But it, it's, it's within a certain range of uh, correctness, OK? So well, normally, we could just run with this estimator by itself. But the problem with that is we wouldn't have the accuracy that we want for our particular filtering application. What we really want is we want to run the main block at low energy and have both high performance and low power. The problem is when you take this main block and you start reducing its voltage, you get errors on the main block. At some point, it doesn't compute the right value. And then you can get noise in the output signal. So what he does here is he just checks the estimator estimate to the output of the main block. And if the estimator, which is small and simple and always runs reliable, if the estimator's estimate indicates the main block is out of that estimate, then the, it means something happened in the main block computation. It didn't have enough energy to produce a valid result. And so then we just substitute in the estimator to the output. So on some occasions, we use the estimator output. But in most times, we use the correct high accurate main block output. And then we start pumping down the amount of voltage. And, and the energy drops, the energy drops, the energy drops. At, at some point. You, you get you get estimator outputs more and more and more. And so you, the quality of the output starts to degrade. But you reach this, this sort of energy minimal point where it's way better than the main block could do by itself. Really cool idea. And here's another uh, kind of technology, but here positioned more uh, towards like a long haul transmission of a data value from one part of the chip to the next. And here they're actually using, um, they're actually varying the frequency and the voltage on a long haul wire in a design. And then basically using error correction techniques to figure out if there was any glitches on that line. And then trying to drive the voltage on these long haul wires as low as possible to try and reduce the amount of energy that the system takes to compute. And then here's my work, it's another, a uh, piece of work I've done that uh, is really cool. It's this idea of building a special latch. All you have to do is replace the latch in a circuit design. And you need you have a little support in the microarchitecture as well. And what this latch does is it takes two samples on the output of any stage. It takes the aggressive sample, forwards it on. And then it takes a late sample about halfway into the next cycle to see if they differ. That's called the shadow latch. If they differ, what that means is that the uh, previous stage wasn't done computing when you sent that forward that value on. So you actually forward a bogus value onto the next stage. And when that occurs, we just flush the pipeline. <laughs> and, but we use the shadow latch value to forward on into the rest of the pipeline. So that's a couple of nice features. One, we know if there was a timing error and we can flush the pipeline stage that's next. We can grab the correct value out of the shadow latch and send it on. So we can, we're guaranteed forward progress. And then we flush the rest of the pipeline and start on the next instruction. So now we have the ability to tolerate timing errors in our circuits. And so now we can start cranking down our voltage, cranking down our voltage, and watching that error rate. And what you really want to do is you want to lower that voltage until the error rate is just a very small error rate. And you want to stay at that error rate. And so whatever energy you have for that chip, you're going to be minimizing the margins, minimizing the amount of energy it takes, detecting when you don't have enough energy, correcting in the microarchitecture, and really sort of breaking this, you know, this traditional tie between the amount of energy it takes to uh, compute and how reliable you are. And what we found is that, you know, by adding about 10% area to the chip, we could reduce the overall energy by 55%. That's a striking number. That's a striking number because it says that half of the energy of the chip is just to make it reliable. And this is an old piece of work, but I've been dredging this work up again because there's a big trend in computer architecture right now to look at what's called sustainability. Like how much energy should we need to do the computation we want. And it's still the case that technologies that don't use razor, 
you use traditional just sort of guard banding on voltage and frequency. Half of the energy of your chips are spent just making sure that they will never fail. That's not very sustainable computing. And I think that it's interesting to think how maybe a technology like this could save the world a lot of energy. So it's a lot of fun. The way you control the chip is you basically monitor the error rate out of the chip. And you wanna make sure that you have a fairly low error rate at all times. You wanna, you never want an error rate of zero. That means you got some margin and you never want a high error rate. That means you're not at a high enough voltage. And so you just build what's called a PID control system. If you've taken any control systems class you saw on day one, they start talking about PIDs, proportional control system. So basically, if the error rate is small, we leave the voltage alone. If the error rate goes up, we raise the voltage a tiny bit until it's small again. If the error rate goes down, we lower the voltage until it comes to that fixed point. And we found that like the sort of the sweet spot was an error rate of about 1%, something like a very low branch mis misprediction rate. And we ended up with 30 to 50% energy savings at that point. Really interesting stuff. And a way that reliability can provide huge advancements in reducing power. So super excited about that stuff. That's what I have for my lecture today. I'd love to have some chat time. I'm gonna switch over to um, back to the classroom here, and I will welcome your questions, anything. This is an AMA portion of the lecture. Ask me anything uh, you would like. So who will be my first asker of questions? And I'll just say the only bad question is a question never asked. Uh, OK, thank you for the opportunity. Oh. Uh, my name is Solomon. OK. Uh, of course, you said uh, some material uh, properties enhancement for, I think, transistor uh, will uh, help in reducing this uh, uh, fault occurrences. For example, the reduction of uh, the thickness of the gate oxide. Yeah. Uh, of course, I have seen some uh, uh, reports in literature uh, about, for example, gun transistors, as well as, of course, uh, silicon cathode. I think they have uh, more uh, uh, radiation tolerance than uh, CMOS, uh, even the smallest uh, uh, nanotechnologies nowadays. Yeah more than that. So uh, what is uh, your opinion in this regard? I mean, regarding the gun material, special. Uh, my second question is, uh, still, uh, you know, uh, for every design, the bottleneck lies, of course, uh, for example, at the end, at the water. Uh, say, for example, as you thank you for your, uh, uh, you ask for your, uh, uh, kindness to share your own work. Uh, there also, you said uh, there is a checker core. Uh, I think uh, a fault occurring in the checker core itself will completely <laughs> stop the execution of even the main processor. The same is true with I'm uh, actually working on the same type of project. So uh, this uh, water, uh, in what way is water uh, will not be a problem? in overall system design, uh, if you have any suggestion on this. Great questions, yeah. great questions. Thank you, Solomon. Oh, was, the first, was the first technology gallium arsenide? Was that the technology you were referring to? Yeah, gallium nitride. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, well, those, those are active technologies and they're uh, more charged. So if, if, we, if you have more charge in your devices, you have a natural reduction in, in uh, in the overall susceptibility to soft errors, definitely. I think the downside of those technologies is nobody uses them. Uh, everybody, it seems like the industry cannot get off of CMOS. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, CMOS is the, it, you know, it, why is CMOS so popular? It's popular because A, it's easy to use, right? It's the most forgiving technology ever, right? Because 
it, there's no there's no timing involved with it. You put your state, you make sure it gets to the latches, done, right? There's no glitches, nothing. So it's really hard to get past CMOS. And CMOS is always almost always a silicon-based technology. So yeah, I let I mean it, it would be great if we could have you know the, sort of the additional charge you have of that, but uh, you know, I, I haven't seen that and even looking you know i get i work a lot with intel and and uh and and nvidia and tsmc and you know nobody's talking about it unfortunately but they're they they are they're talking about tfets and stuff like that but they're still silicon based technology and then your other question that's a really good question like uh so solomon pointed out that when you have faults in your voter circuit so you have one two three and you get a fault in your voter circuit, then you basically you've declared a fault that may not have occurred. And if you get a permanent fault there, then you the whole thing is broken. And that is such a great observation. What you have going for you is size, size, and um, and and you can build the the, the voter circuits are naturally small, right? And so yeah, you, you mean. Think, uh... Uh, size you mean area yeah yeah of course yeah. if you think of the arrival of a transient fault you know one of the other mitigating factors is you know we have masking and and all the masking effects if 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 your coverage is such that this you know 0.2 percent of my area is susceptible to transient faults because that's what checks for transient faults that's mitigated by the 98.8% of the chip that is tested. So, you know, the fact that the voter and the checker circuits are small is, uh, is a mitigating factor. And the checker logic in the DIVA system is much smaller than the main core, which does mitigate that its susceptibility to permanent transient faults. But it's even better than that, Solomon. With transient faults, you can always assume the transient fault was in the checker and just re-execute and see if you get the same result. If, you know, if it was in the checker, you just did the same computation again, and that's fine. If it was in one of the cores, you did a correction. So in terms of transient faults, whether it was in your checker, whether it was in your checked components, re-execution still fixes the problem so but in terms of permanent faults it doesn't so there in that case then you want to make sure those checker circuits as small as possible and one thing i always like to tell students is there's no such thing as 100 percent reliable right if anybody mm -hmm. says it's 100 percent reliable they either they're lying or they don't understand reliability right even take take a the example i like to give is the voyager spacecraft one of the most reliable computers ever built. They sent Voyager 1 and then they sent Voyager 2, right? Because Voyager 1 might have died. Uh, because there is no such thing as 100% reliable. You always have to get to the point where you decide if there's a fault and that circuit is going to be exposed. So you want to make sure that the exposure is as little as possible, but you never get to 100% reliable. You can say the same thing about security. There's no such thing as 100% secure. It's impossible, right? Because it, you know, there's always something that could be it could be attacked. So, uh, but but again, we're just trying to build systems that are, you know, two nines, three nines, four nines, five nines, and I think that's definitely possible in today's world, especially with technologies like some of them we talked about today. Thank you for the question. Another question. If you don't mind, let me add sure. one. Glad to. Glad uh, to answer. Do you think, uh, say, uh, as a measure of, as, for example, as a measure of uh, reliability index, say, can, can I say uh, reliability per power or power per reliability uh, comparing two systems, for example, two sim redundant system or fault tolerant system? Can I compare based on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you, if you have two reliable systems, you're going to compare on coverage, right? So that is like, what's the probability if there is a fault in the threat model, or the fault model, that it's detected, 
And then you're going to compare each of those to a baseline system that is unprotected. And there's going to be a soft, there's going to be a, a power overhead, a performance overhead, maybe even a software overhead as well. So you, and they call it the PAS uh, analysis. So, and then you need to make a decision, right? Is, you know, is the additional coverage that the one that's better in terms of coverage, does it provide enough additional coverage to pay for the extra performance and power that it may be spending? In the event that it provides additional coverage at less power and less performance, then what it does is it makes the other approach obsolete, right? So uh, unless there's some other aspect that you can characterize as important, um, it would make it would basically destroy the value of the other of the other technology. Yeah, uh, for example, uh, five modular redundancy as compared to three pill modular exactly. redundancy, yeah. the reliability is higher, but still when we go to power, power per reliability is <laughs> very different. So exactly, exactly. That is what I mean. Yeah. It's interesting, like uh, the space shuttle, the U U.S. space shuttle avionics system was five-way redundant. <laughs> okay, and not only was it redundant in terms of its design, so it had five modules with a voting unit. I mean, there they, they, they there, so there the cost was, you know, coverage was lack of coverage meant death to the astronauts. So th they were willing to pay quite a bit for additional coverage in that case. But it's very, it's also very interesting. That was an N version design as well. So five version design, what does that mean? That meant that the avionics of the space shuttle, the thing that controlled the rockets and the, and the, you know, it's, it's, you know, that flew the, and did the landing as well. Um, it had five different systems voting to check for transient and permanent faults. And then the software implementation on each of the five was done by a different team. And the idea there is, is that if someone introduced a bug into the avionics, that hopefully three of them would not introduce the same bug. Pretty interesting design. That is, that's true redundancy. Deep, deep, deep redundancy, both in terms of design and power and performance and, and correctness. Any additional questions? All right, well, uh, let me check the chat here. Make sure I don't have any. Great. Okay, fantastic. Well, if there's no other chat questions, I will... Um, uh, bid you adieu. Uh, Fitzum, what's what's coming up on the schedule for the class? Do we have Fitzum here? I can look and tell you one second. I'm here. Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, so coming up, uh, like student presentations, and there are uh, like one or two uh, guest lectures. One by Abraham at some point. Ah, maybe in two weeks. Yeah. Am and I another, doing? Another... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. This, this was the last one. Uh, do, do you have another one? Like uh, in my? Uh, possibly. I'll, I'll, I'll chat with you about that, okay? Okay. Good. Good. All right. And thank well, you for the presentation today. Thank you, everybody. I hope uh, the rest of your course goes well. And I uh, look forward to meeting you one day. I, I thank you so much. Uh, I occasionally make the AIT. So maybe we'll thank you so much. It was very nice presentation. Thanks, very nice thank, thank you, all. sir. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.